Thank you. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to welcome you all to UCL today for the It's All Academic Festival. I'm James Davis, Executive Head of Alumni Relations. We've got a whole mixture of people here today. Um, we've got staff, students, we've got alumni, we've got friends and supporters of UCL, um, and we've got people who've never even been to the university before. Um, so it's a really, really um, eclectic mix of people and I hope you have a fantastic day. Um, whether you've known UCL for decades, um, or this is, or you know nothing about us at all, I can guarantee you'll learn something new and exciting today. Um, in fact, to prove the point, throughout the day we have an area where you can test what's living on your phone, which I'm sure will uh, provide some unexpected results for some of us. The range of activities really is truly impressive, and I want to extend a big thank you to everyone who had a part in organizing today. There are programs in this room. There's programs over in the front quad across the road. There are also food and drink stalls um, and live music. So please do explore of the day and have a really good time. Now, I love working at UCL because it's never boring. There's always somebody doing something fantastic around every corner. Um, and this event is about a world, the world of the future um, and how that's being shaped and understood by today's research. We have an excellent panel of speakers um, who are going to try and convince you of their vision of what we'll all be thinking and doing in the future. So please do test them hard, challenge them, um, make them work hard this morning. I'm also delighted that we've got our brilliant um, and highly experienced host, Mark Lawson, with us today. Mark graduated in English um, and has gone on to a varied and highly successful creative career as a journalist, a broadcaster, presenter, and writer, author of books, and radio plays. So without further ado, it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Mark um, to kick the debate off. Mark Lawson, everyone. Thank you, James. <laughs> Thank you, James. Welcome to this session on the um, future human in which we're going to discuss, first of all, on the panel and then with you, and then also we're going to have contributions via apps and tweets, which will be read out uh, by Abigail, um, and we're going to discuss that. When I was here, this was part of University College Hospital, uh, which some of you will, will remember. So we used to be brought here if we'd studied too hard um, all night um, and had to come here. But anyway, now it's um, dedicated entirely to uh, academia. Um, I've been uh, asked to just say that this is um, not a safe space. Um, because uh, some people, as they're untitled to, worry about these things. You may hear things that you um, don't want to hear. Um, if you don't like them, then you'd have to leave at that point, or we would encourage you to engage with the, um, uh, the people who've said them, um, either in the room or on the stage, and we try to deal with it that way. Uh, so the panel, so what's going to happen is they're going to give a five-minute um, speech each and we've got a rather menacing green digital countdown from five at the front of the stage to make sure that they don't ramble on forever um, if they try to i'll stop them um, so they're going to talk for five minutes each and then we'll open it up to you and to the wider audience beyond this this is being streamed um, and so we will have an external response <coughs> but we also want lots of internal ones so the panel I will explain in order. Professor Peter Rees, Professor of Places and City Planning in the Bartlett um, at UCL. Uh, he says that his proudest achievement um, when he worked as the City of London Corporation City Planning Officer, so anything you don't like when you were walking here, it's all his fault. Um, so you can raise that with him. But his greatest achievement was getting nightclubs and pubs to stay open later, um, <laughs> thus providing work for the new UCL there, um, UCH. Um, and then we have uh, Dr. Chamko or Cham Gag, reader in physics and one of the UK's leading figures in the search for dark matter. 
Um, if you're worried about what dark matter is, he's going to explain it at the beginning of his um, speech. Dr. Sarah Micklejohn is reader in cryptography and security, an expert on cryptocurrencies and blockchains. So she already knows everything that's in your phone and how much Bitcoin you've got um, with you today. Uh, so Sarah will be talking about some of that. And then Professor Mark Medovnik, uh, Professor of Materials and Society and Director of the Institute of Making. And he, among other things, is developing smart materials that can heal themselves. Uh, that's one of the things that he will be talking about. Um, so the order was decided um, between the panelists. And so um, I'd like to start, and um, the countdown will begin shortly, with Professor Peter Rees, Professor of Places and City Planning in the Bartlett. The magic. <clears throat> well, that was good. Two words and a round of applause. Excellent. <laughs> the magic is in the name. UCL. Not university. There are lots of those. Not college. Plenty of those. But London. London, the incredible city. That's why I came to UCL. It was for London. You had to learn something at the same time. That was just the price to pay for being in London and being exposed to all those opportunities. Now, London's a unique city. It has a history of 2,000 years of trade. Ever since a couple of boatloads of drunken, sex-starved Roman sailors ran aground in the Thames at a point where there happened to be a low hill and they built the first city of London, it has been adapting to change. It is the world's leading expert at change adaptation, this city. We don't know how it does it, thank goodness. Because if we did, there'd be Londons all over China. They constantly used to come to the city of London and ask me, how do you adapt? How can you be a world financial center? We want to be a world financial center. And I used to say, we don't know, so we can't tell you. <laughs> and that was absolutely fantastic. It is a city that adapts constantly to the pressure of change. So if you're going to face a changing world, and this is a world that's changing as fast as ever, although people have always been saying that. I remember when I was a student in the late 60s reading a book called Future Change by Alvin Toffler, a famous Canadian academic, and being frightened out of my wits about the way the world was speeding up and I wouldn't be able to keep up with it. Well, decades later, I'm still here and I'm still enjoying it and I'm still surfing change. And I can't think of a better place to be to do it in than London. It's interesting that on that very spot where the Romans established the first city of London, this trading port, the towers of the city's office cluster, the gherkin, the walkie-talkie, and the cheese grater, are at that same point. So there's 2,000 years of change from that Roman trading outpost to the center of the financial cluster of the city of London. And I think that's an amazing 2,000-year history. But, as Mark said, I don't take credit for that. I think it's much more important that on a Thursday night, the City of London is party central. In, when I took over in 1985, you finished work at 5 in the evening, you ran back over London Bridge to go home to the suburbs because they were more interesting than the centre of London, or you had to go to the West End to have a party. Now they stay on in the city, and there are bars open till 4 in the morning, whereas at 1985, all the pubs closed at 8.30. Now that's progress, because when you're in the bar, when you're in the pub, you're with other people. And that's our other secret ingredient, gossip. People go to where the gossip is hottest. And in terms of business gossip, you ain't going to get any hotter gossip than you get in the square mile. That's why the world's biggest collector of business gossip, Bloomberg, has their European headquarters, brand new, built by Norman Foster, right in the heart of the city. That's why the city is still the thriving place it is. Now, you'll never get that in a French cafe, because in a French cafe, you sit at tables with your friends. The only news you ever hear is the gossip of your friends. Well, you knew that. What's the point of going? In a pub, after a couple of beers, you get a bit closer to the group behind. You drink standing up rather than sitting down, and you get to know what's going on. You probably come out of the pub with a better job, but you can't remember where it is. <laughs> so we need cities that adapt and change, but we need to maintain the things that bind people together, the social things. And that's why I believe places, 
That's why I wanted to take the title I did when I came back to UCL as a professor. That's why I believe places are the most important fundamental for all of us. Some people in times of change look to religion for comfort. Some people look to national identity and we see these things strengthening at times of great change. I say the thing we should put our efforts into are the neighborhoods where we live. Because if we bond with the place where we live and the people that live there, then we have a basis, we have a, a foundation on which to cope with the change. Some might say it's a comfort blanket. I say it's much more than that. It's actually bolting yourself down when there's a very strong wind blowing. And that's probably a, a topical reference at the moment. So we're painting a picture of a wonderful place. We're painting a picture that has everything looking good. Well, of course it isn't. Because in addition to the cluster of office towers in the city, we're now seeing towers springing up all over London, built as an investment opportunity. They are homes for people that won't live in them. Flats all the way along the banks of the Thames that are piles of safety deposit boxes. Now, there's got to be a solution to that. And I pose that as my parting problem to you, how we're going to cope with this housing issue in London. And it isn't building skyscrapers for investment. The answer is generation rent. You've got it in that one word. Rent is the future. We rent our bikes, we rent our cars, we should be renting our homes, and rent will take us forward for a successful future for London. But don't worry, London will cope with the future. So mind the gap, but don't all change. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll have a bit of chat among us um, before we hear the next speech. Um, Peter, I'll raise now because I think it may well be raised on the external contributions. Um, there is a view that London has too much of everything, too many people, too much money, too much attention. Um, the government moved Channel 4 and the BBC out of London. Um, England football internationals are going to take place around the country more and more. Uh, cabinet meetings, there was one recently in Salford. So let's address that because people will raise it that um, London is overrated and overcovered. Which is why people from all over the world keep coming here. I agree with you. Um, and that's a good thing. I mean, success is wonderful, isn't it? But I, I would agree on one thing. I think we should continue to move some things out of London. And the primary thing we must move out of London is the government. The government is holding <laughs> London back. Um, I think, you know, send the government to Manchester and let them prove how effective they, they or, really or are. Or to Brussels, that would be interesting. Uh, stand, well, no, 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 the place I'd really right. like to have it is somewhere central in England. Um, in order to annoy the French, I'd put it in Aspe Ashby de la Zouche. <laughs> Um, and among us, because we're talking, this event today is about the future. Um, at various times in recent history, and even now, some people assume that there won't be a future. This whole day assumes there will be one. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in Chicago, as many of you will know, have something called the Doomsday Clock, which um, for many decades now, they have a symbolic clock and they put the hand closer to midnight, depending on the jeopardy to the future of the planet and uh, humankind that they see. Um, now, we have a bit of audience participation. Does anyone know where the doomsday clock in Chicago, where the minute hand is standing at the moment? Yes. Two minutes to midnight, correct. And the significance of that is that, for example, for points of comparison, 19, um, uh, 1991, um, after the fall of communism, it was at 20 to midnight. Um, even at the peak of the Cold War, it was at two and a half minutes to midnight. Um, so uh, on that question, um, and we can imagine uh, North Korea, um, climate change were the reasons that they put it at two minutes to midnight. There are rumors that when they do the next adjustment, they may come back 30 seconds, but who knows. So let's um, address that. This is a big one to go for. Um, Sarah, um, is there a future or might as well, we could just go home and finish this session now? Um, I mean, I'm relatively optimistic about the future of humanity, uh, certainly about the future of our planet. You know, um, I think our, our planet's going to be okay whether we are or not, which is sort of one form of optimism, I guess. Um, but yeah, relatively optimistic, let's say. Chan, what about you? Optimistic? Um, I'm optimistic if we change. If, uh, and we need some radical change. The, 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 the planetary systems are showing us that um, we can't sustain the way we're living. It's as simple as that. Climate change is already going to bring about um, 
some seriously devastating consequences that are going to force um, us to operate in different ways, either get worse and worse and worse or not. At the moment, you know, of the 8 million or so species that we know about, we're wiping out between 80 and 150 every day. You know, it's, it's, uh, it might seem like it's all well and good and we're going to solve all of this, but actually, um, when you look at the data, it's very clear that we have to have some big, major changes in the way, not necessarily in the infrastructure, but in the way we, we uh, cooperate and work together and come together, I think. Uh, we'll talk about some of those this morning. Mark? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic, but I, I, th I think change is not only inevitable in order to survive, but I think that there probably will be some sort of bifurcation of the human race. So humans like us, I think, will maybe be in jeopardy in the future for, for various different reasons. It might be might just be because what replaces us as sort of sentient entities on the planet may may not find room for us or uh, I, mean, I think those dangers are are, 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 are real uh, and I think that this century will show us uh, that there will be a point where we have some choices to make that we have to agree on and I think the problem is it sort of has to be a global agreement, and that seems very unlikely. So climate change is one area where we need to globally agree and do stuff together, and that looks like it's not going to happen. But then I think sort of the move towards transhumanism and, and other forms of life uh, that are artificial may also require some sort of regulation which we may not agree on, and so off it will just go. And uh, Peter, you were talking about London, what London might look like in the future. I know someone who works for the security services, or they claim they do, and when um, we, um, I was walking through London with him, and it was quite terrifying. He'd done all these, they'd done all these war games in which they talked about huge London uh, landmarks, skylines, Trafalgar Square being wiped out by a nuclear suitcase bomb, because that's what they do, is um, imagining the worst, doesn't mean it will happen, but they have to. Uh, so what, um, we can't, we don't know if that will or will not happen, but London, what might the London of the future look like? Gower Street's a good example because it's pretty much as it was when I was, most of it as it was when I was here in the 80s, when people were here in the 60s, and then you have that huge new hospital building at the end. So just give a sense of what London might look like in the future. Well, I, I don't get too exercised about security. I mean, after all, Salisbury is much more dangerous. <laughs> um, but the, if we talk about the shape of London streets. That's one of the key things. It's how do we use the amount of road space we've got uh, to best advantage. And that's going to be very competitive. I mean, there is a current plan with Camden Council uh, to stuff two-way traffic back into Gower Street, splitting UCL in two, in order to have market stalls in Tottenham Court Road. Wow. Now, that doesn't to me seem like progress. But of course, it's being done by traffic engineers. So um, planners and traffic engineers never see eye to eye. We, pedestrianised we, Oxford Street, that keeps coming up, doesn't it? It does, but how do you pedestrianise Oxford Street? In order to have more tourists dropping ice cream on the street, you're going to stuff all the buses down Wigmore Street and ruin Marylebone and uh, Mayfair. So I don't see the benefit. As far as I'm concerned, streets like Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Street are the boundaries between different areas with character. I'm more concerned about what goes on behind those dreadful streets Let's keep the dreadfulness in those streets and let's actually make the places better. Well, that's um, how we're going to arrange today, because that's very specific street level examples. And then uh, Dr. Chamkor Cham Gag is now going to talk about um, a much bigger and wider subject, including dark matter. Cham. Yeah. Uh, so let me begin um, by just asking what, what is dark matter? Well, we don't know. Um, we, we, we think it's particles, um, and these would be particles created in the Big Bang 14 billion years ago and all around us right now, streaming through all of us at about half a million miles an hour. Um, actually, if I, everyone raise your hand, just put your, put your finger up. Um, going through your fingertip every single second is about one million dark matter particles, right, at this half a million miles an hour. But you'd have to keep your finger up for about a thousand years before any of them actually did anything. Okay? So it's, it's, it's weird, it's weird stuff. But just because it's sort of unseen, um, very hard to detect, um, and you know, we, we don't understand the nature of it, doesn't mean that it isn't crucial to our place in the cosmos. It's 85% of all the stuff in the universe. <clears throat> it quite literally holds our galaxy together 
and at the same time it connects us to other galaxies in this you know, amazing, beautiful cosmic network of unimaginable proportions. It's, it really is beautiful stuff. Um, dark matter is this unseen glue that connects everything. Now, I think that the, the future of humanity depends on us exposing the hidden beauty and power and value in what connects all of us. Um, it's dissolving those barriers that are, that are pushing us all apart. Um, I, I believe it's necessary and I believe it's time. I, um, three years ago, um, when my uh, first child, my daughter, was um, being born, it, that time coincided with me uh, starting to teach a new course in environmental physics. And it's the first time I'd done anything outside of, sort of particle physics, which is my normal sort of area. And at the same time, I had all these sort of emotions mixing around in me, this joy and elation, but also fears and insecurities at a personal level. There was this growing appreciation for our environment and the Earth, and the, the, the interdependent and interconnected, but really precarious balance of all the life on it. The um, thinnest of atmospheres that we rely on, the narrowest of conditions in, on the land and on the, in the seas. And as I learned more and more and more about how close we've come to tipping points, to irreversible destruction to those very systems that sustain us and, and life, there was this growing, growing pain um, that sort of led me on a, on a journey to understand more and more and more about all the various factors that are, that are contributing to this and, and what's brought us here to this point now. And the thing that was highlighted more than anything else was that we've become disconnected. We've become disconnected from nature, from each other, and from ourselves. Um, and it's a... I believe it's, 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 addressing, it's addressing that that very issue that, that um, you know, we need to, that we'll have to do to move forward if, we're gonna, if the future human is to have overcome these challenges that we face. So the, the future human, it depends on what we do right now. It's, it's us. We are the, are the stewards of evolution. We're the, we're the gatekeepers. What goes on into the future um, depends on what we choose to allow to go through us. We can allow things to pass, we can stop things, or we can change things. Um, and it's that, it's that responsibility that we have to really take seriously. Um, it's not just going to happen by itself. Um, what looks like it's going to happen by itself if we just leave things unchanged is, is pretty clear. And it's, the research is painting a very stark picture of what that looks like. So, you know, what does this change look like? What is this, you know, emergent future um, that many of us can feel but don't really know how to engage with? Well, there are, there are examples popping up all over the world. There's you know, research institutions and companies and people's movements that are sort of abandoning old paradigms and embracing new principles like um, radical openness and non-hierarchical structures. And they're coming together building um, networks that value the openly stated intention and set of values that are put out there to begin with. And it's around that that people of different disciplines and different um, experiences and expertise are coming together and with that shared goal that shared sort of very clearly seeing the way the emergent the, the future human will will think and, and act and live um, and so that, that that brings me to something that we're starting here at UCL actually it's um, it's a, a new initiative we're kicking off called CoLab um, because as, as London's global university we've got a responsibility to the global community we've got to seriously look at our um, our position in, in the, uh, the value chain of, of society. And you know, we've got to expose any links that we can leverage towards um, positive change to these global issues. So the CoLab um, recognizes the, the expertise and the world leading sort of academics and researchers and um, teachers and administrators and students um, that we have in the UCL community. But it, it goes beyond that to value and connect and expose um, the, the, the shared um, passion around particular problems. Right? And it's, it's allowing that individual skill and experience that, that have been built up during you know, whatever, whatever narrow discipline we may have you know, become experts in, to come to a table as a, as a whole self, brought together around common, common issues, and then see what comes from that. And what the research is showing us is that we when you get people with openly instated sort of intention and values 
brought around a common problem, bringing their expertise and their whole self, their sort of authentic self, almost leaving the ego at the door, if you like, in some sense. Um, what that creates is unpredictable, but incredible. So I'd like to ask you all to consider where you think the solutions to the global issues that we face are going to come from. I'd like you to consider whether the expertise and the experiences that you've brought into, the, the, that have worked so effectively in your own lives uh, and your own work, whether they might not just be meant for a, a bit more. Um, I believe that the future human begins with us. Thank you. Thank you. Before we bring in um, Sarah, Sarah's going to talk about um, some very new things, uh, such as cryptocurrencies and so on. But um, in the paper this morning, there's an academic survey, not from here, I think, but it, anyway, it essentially, you may have read it, um, has concluded that children, alarmingly for parents, children are born with unchangeable and fixed personalities and that parenthood is essentially just damage limitation or containment from um, then on. But on that wider question, um, because uh, Cham is talking about change and how we can change. Um, human nature, that thing we use, human nature, is, is there such a thing as human nature which is unfixed? To what extent can we change? I, mean, I feel that, that we have this sort of slightly overblown feeling of what, um, what is in within us is, is, is what we are, I suppose. I, I think that, in fact, all of this stuff around us is, is us too, and that this... <coughs> constant dialogue between what we build and make is what is what we're reacting to living in and so as we change technology we change so I, for me there's obviously a genetic component as you alluded to but but actually there's a kind of component that is basically about historic history and about the built environment and about technology and that makes us the humans we are today, which will be different in 50 years' time and will be different in 200 years' time and was different 50 years ago. And so, um, if it overlaps with what you can say, then just um, uh, wait until you talk. But um, social media is a famous example of this, that people argue over whether social media has made people nastier or it has given people an outlet for nastiness that was already there. But that's kind of a general question about um, uh, human, you know, which comes first, the technology or the behavior? Well, I mean, I think in that case, you know, the behavior was sort of always there in some latent sense, perhaps. I mean, I, I think there's no question really that social media has changed us, you know, has triggered sort of psychological responses, you know, in terms of this kind of ever presence, you know, always notifications there. Um, so I, I think that's a, a given, and I, I will touch on some of that in mm -hmm. what I'm going to say, I guess. Okay, well, as I say, you, uh, so yeah, um, on that, to what extent, Cam, you talked about some of that, Cam, but yeah. you seem quite optimistic that we can change. Yeah, I, I think we've got to also look at the neuroscience. I mean, a lot of the research that we're doing here at UCL, but also other institutions, is showing that this notion of human nature is just, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, you know, where does a human begin and all this stuff, and what is nature? It, it's, it's, it's a simplification. I, I agree very much with what Mark's saying in terms of, you know, a lot of, uh, what, what we're creating out here is not just our conscious constructs, but our unconscious representing itself as well. There, there is, there's a lot more going on here. And we're starting to see that in MRI scanners, right? The data is showing us that, ah, look, we've tipped very much into almost left hemispherical processes of thought and this addiction to thought that projects into the future based on what it knows. And a relaxation of that somewhat, sort of coming more into right hemispherical processes is, is is doable if we have the right um, uh, set of tools, education, I guess, all this kind of stuff. But the, but the data is starting to show this. It, it, you know, many few years ago, I'd have thought, ah, hocus pocus. But but now, you know, the, the data is there. It, it's showing that okay, there's something fundamentally, um, something fundamental going on about the way we're using our brains that is um, actually divorcing us from uh, feeling, from sense that that you know perception. Um, that we can use to understand whether we're in danger or not. Uh, our, our ability to tune into homeostasis is being compromised. And we're seeing that in the, in the earth, in, in natural systems, in all kinds of systems reacting. 
And Peter, it's interesting, you're all teachers, and a lot of people in the room are. Um, a good example of the relationship between psychology and technology is education, because uh, students of um, my day, your day, we came here, if we wanted to know something, we had to go to a library down the road and look it up, and it was often quite a cumbersome process, uh, whereas people can now look it up on their phones. I mean, it, it's a huge change. It's, it's bound to change uh, people. It is. A big, uh, it, one of the biggest barriers is that in a lecture theatre like this, when, you're, when it's full of students, uh, they all have something far more interesting in front of them than you are. Um, you know, on their iPhone, they can access the whole world. Why should they bother with you? But places have a big influence on the way people behave. I don't believe we're pre-programmed and can't change. If people go into a religious building, they speak more quietly, they calm down, same in the library. In a station or an airport, they get more agitated, walk more quickly, and on a tennis court, they throw a tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd now like to invite um, Dr. Sarah Micklejohn to talk, a reader in cryptography and security, to give her five-minute talk. Thank you. Um, so I guess in looking to the future, I also wanted to start with the past, uh, not quite as far back as the Big Bang, but um, let's say the last sort of decade. And uh, in particular, I want to address what I think has been a real sort of societal shift um, where we've seen a lot of people losing trust in these kind of core institutions that form our society. And actually, if you look at what's driving this erosion in trust and this lack of trust, uh, it's actually quite rational, I would say. You know, so starting about 10 years ago, we saw this global financial collapse. Um, you know, I can't even remember how long ago now uh, we had this sort of revelation that our governments were collecting lots and lots of data on us and, and storing it and sort of conducting mass surveillance. And especially as someone who was doing a PhD in computer science in the US at the time, this was a really quite a shocking piece of information. So, you know, as we sort of lose trust in these kind of central traditional institutions, I think we've also seen a real shift in moving that trust elsewhere, right? I mean, humans sort of are very trusting. We, we like to have these institutions. And so I would argue that, you know, where some of that trust went, where in fact a lot of that trust went, was into technological platforms like Facebook and like Google. And unfortunately, we've, we've kind of seen how that's worked out as well, right? So it's gotten to the point where in the past year or two, we've seen that ad campaigns uh, conducted on these platforms have definitely had some and maybe quite a large influence on things up to the level of national elections. So essentially, we're sort of at a very crucial moment, I think, with our relationship with these institutions, right? So this is a very sort of bleak uh, look at how trust has evolved in the last 10 years. Uh, but this is really just to motivate what I sort of hope we see in the future of humanity, which is this idea of transparency and a stronger sense of accountability. So I don't think that any of these institutions that I've described are evil. Uh, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with them or inherently wrong with having institutions like this around. I think it's quite inevitable in you know, human society that, that things centralize and that we sort of have these, these pillars. Um, I think the problem is that the way these institutions currently operate is completely opaque, right? So the decisions that they make are really behind closed doors. You know, how do, how do government policies come about? Of course, there, there are processes, um, and they are sort of made visible to some people, but to your average sort of citizen, uh, it, it, there's not really much behind it. And similarly, and especially actually, I would say, with these tech platforms, uh, which currently, you know, don't have a lot of regulation, uh, we really just don't have any visibility. You know, what data do they keep on us? Which advertisers do they share it with? You know, what do they allow advertisers to target users for? You know, and what makes them make that decision in a certain way? Uh, we just don't have any visibility, right? And moreover, these platforms really aren't accountable to us as their users. So the current situation is essentially you can trust these platforms unilaterally uh, or you can opt out. And it's very easy, well, it's not very easy actually, but it's easier anyway to think about opting out of something like Facebook. Uh, it's even possible, potentially, to think about opting out of something like a bank account. Uh, but it's very, very difficult, I think, uh, to think about opting out of 
entire nation states or governments. And uh, actually, you do see some people these days reacting so strongly that they're trying it. Uh, but I think, you know, collectively, it's very difficult to pursue that seriously. Um, so that's sort of these technologies that I want to talk about today. So there's sort of these emerging classes of technologies that are specifically designed to provide greater transparency and to provide greater accountability. So one example of such a technology is Bitcoin. Uh, maybe you've read about Bitcoin in the news. Maybe you've seen ads for it on the tube or on the side of black cabs. Um, at its heart, Bitcoin is essentially a, a currency. It's called a cryptocurrency. And uh, it's really trying to achieve the same things that any other currency is trying to achieve. So it's uh, trying to allow for the transfer of funds from one user to another. Uh, but the way it's doing it is completely transparent. So every Bitcoin transaction that's ever taken place is visible on a ledger. You and I can go look at that ledger today. In fact, in the sort of vision of Bitcoin, you and I get to be gatekeepers to this ledger. We get to say, you know, this transaction is good and I'm going to let it in the ledger, or it's not good and I don't think it should be allowed. So Bitcoin sort of exists today. Uh, what gets people really excited about these technologies, I think, is not what Bitcoin is doing, but actually what's possible. So if you imagine sort of looking at voting systems or looking at supply chains, uh, or looking at these tech platforms and the data they share with advertisers. And you imagine sort of taking that data and putting that on a kind of visible or auditable or accountable ledger. Then all of a sudden, the kind of claims that you see, you know, when you go into the supermarket and they say, oh, these berries are British or, you know, these courgette are organically farmed. Uh, these are claims that you, you don't just have to take at face value. You could actually start to verify these uh, in a meaningful way. And again, the same can be true for elections and uh, the same can be true for, you know, how social media platforms use your data and share it with advertisers. So, of course, this is all very hopeful, I think, you know, um, we're in very early days with these technologies. No one knows, uh, you know, are we going to really achieve these things or not? Um, but I, I guess I would say that's my sort of, you know, earnest, hopeful vision of um, what transparency can do for us as a society. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Um, you talk about trust and transparency. Um, one of the things that uh, shocks a lot of parents, shocks a lot of teachers, is the extent to which young people who are often quite paranoid about governments and so on, the amount of themselves and their lives they will put, uh, they will make available. Um, and as a journalist, I'm amazed. Um, if anyone now is accused of a crime or suspected of one, um, newspapers will have pages and pages of pictures of them on holiday 10 years ago, whole family connections with quite grave consequences for the prospects of a free trial if charged and so on. But I'm interested in that area, that it's, um, it's, it's a willing surrender of privacy. Yeah, so actually I've, I, I've sort of been going on about transparency uh, for me and how I got into this space was privacy and mm. it's sort of ironic, you know, I think these two really do go completely hand in hand, right? So it's sort of at the moment, we're completely transparent to these platforms, right? As you said, we, we give over everything. They have, they know everything about us. You know, there's cases where, you know, Amazon knew before a woman that she was pregnant, you mm. know, and, and there's all sorts of things like that. And so I think it's just really two sides of the same coin. You know, we're completely transparent. We sort of lost a lot of our sense of privacy. And so now it's not just about trying to get it back and, you know, put everything back in the box. It's about having them reciprocate, you know, and it's about having these platforms uh, provide a little bit of transparency to us as well. And I was um, really surprised with Bitcoin. I've always thought it was shadowy and secretive. Yeah. But, you, um, but is there not on the dark web, where probably few people in this room have been, but they've seen it on Charlie Brooker's um, Dark Mirror series, um, uh, is, is there not, um, there must be shadowy uh, cryptocurrencies, aren't there, used by criminals and politicians and others? Yeah, so when you have these ledgers of data, it's not as though they're completely transparent, mm. you know, with everyone's name and address. Um, <laughs> so people are operating using pseudonyms. And uh, yeah, it's, it's basically that that sort of enabled this first kind of application of Bitcoin, which was Silk Road and these other sort of uh, underground markets. Um, I will say a lot of my own research has been about showing that they're not that anonymous, that these pseudonyms Fine. don't really buy you a whole lot in the way of meaningful privacy. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, there's still, I think, a, this shadowy reputation, uh, whether it's you know, fully deserved or not. And in the interest of transparency, the panel in the room, um, how, how many of you have, don't worry, there's no one from HMRC here. 
How, how many of you have, have Bitcoin? And on the panel? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, um, Sarah, I mean, we didn't do it uh, mathematically or scientifically, but would that, is that about the kind of um, percentage you'd expect? I'm impressed. It's more than I thought. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, well, do, when we open it up, which will be quite shortly, do contribute and tell us about your Bitcoin and um, uh, how it works. Um, so before we open it up to um, all of you and the wider world beyond streaming, um, Professor Mark um, Mid Midovic uh, will, um, the Professor of Materials and Society and Director of the Institute of Making, will give his five minute address. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so. Yeah, I study materials and I, 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 I want to just spend five minutes telling you what I think the future will be for stuff and that quite a large amount of the stuff around us in the future will be animate. It will be, maybe alive is the wrong word to use for it, but it will do its own thing and in particular it will heal itself. And so I've got five minutes to kind of persuade you, I think, or I'm going to try to, that this is not only a future that I think we should embrace, but it is almost inevitable. Um, okay, so start at the back, at the beginning. Okay, the age of the civilization. We were Stone Age men and women once, and uh, we developed tools, and then we got a liking for that. So we are the we are the people who evolved from the people who decided to not be naked, to get out of the rain and the mud, and so there's a particular journey that we have taken. We like stuff. First of all, we like stone. But then we got the hang of turning stone into metal. Then we liked copper. Then we liked bronze. Then we liked iron. Then we liked steel. And steel gave us a lot of what's around you here today. And so all the time, we've been creating new materials. And if you think about it, if you take those materials away now, we're not us. None of us could survive. We would all die. Uh, so we have co-evolved. Our personalities, our culture, is inextricably linked to, to stuff. You, they, they are the same thing. They are absolutely the same thing, culture and stuff. So um, we have things like this plastic chair. You might say, well, that was perhaps not worth producing. What was wrong with, <clears throat> what was wrong with the wooden chairs? Hmm? <laughs> and we have flip chairs that you're sitting on now, which in a way are a bit of a kind of, they're a sort of kind of rebellious type of chair, aren't they? Like you stand up, they're like, hey. <laughs> Uh, and, and so those kind of things happen all the time. That changes us and it changes the kind of materials we want to, we want to represent ourselves with. The, this stuff is us. It's who we want to be. It's our dreams. It's our hopes. We want to go to the moon, which we must have done for thousands of years looking up at it. We created stuff. We created rockets to get there. We actually made it. It's actually probably the most incredible achievement of our age. But We've got to this point now where the stuff that is us, the stuff that keeps us alive, the hospital stuff, you know, all of that gadgetry that keeps you alive if you have an accident, that stuff is what gives you confidence. It's good stuff. You can go skiing, you can go skydiving, knowing that there's people and hold hospitals available to keep you alive should anything go wrong. That, is, that actually gives us a lot of confidence. It, gives us, it changes us as people. You pick up your phone, you can talk to anyone in the world, pretty much, right? That's just magic. Another bit of stuff that is just super. But it's getting very complicated, isn't it? And uh, it's turning out that all of that stuff has supply chains around the world to mines, to factories, which we are completely out of control with. That it's unsustainable. That your you can see this with your phone. Your phone goes wrong, a tiny little interconnect, you know, microscopically large, goes wrong, the whole phone stops working, and the only thing the person at the other end of the phone can tell you about this is you, we're going to send you a new phone. This is true of, of infrastructure. You only have to look at the bridge collapse in Italy recently to realize that we are so reliant on a whole set of infrastructure to keep us who we are, and yet that infrastructure is getting more and more complicated, just like the phone is getting more and more complicated. The internet, without that, are we who we are? No, clearly not. If the internet goes down, who's going to repair it? Well, they dig a hole in the ground. They then they find all sorts of things like gas pipes, water pipes down there. If any of those go wrong, again, what are we in? So as we build infrastructure over infrastructure, we've made a much more complicated world. And it's turning out that repairing that infrastructure, repairing your phone, is, is uneconomic. So what they do is they tell you to send your phone in and they give you a new one. 
But that's unsustainable from the mineral resources, from the energy perspective, from, probably from an economic perspective. So how can we have this lifestyle? Is it all going to collapse? Um, no, because people like me and other people and my colleagues around the world are working on trying to get that phone to repair itself. So when that tiny interconnect goes wrong, it's not that you have to throw away the whole phone, all that infrastructure. It actually knows it's gone wrong and it will repair itself. Crazy, you say? Well, that's what we do, right? That's how we survive for so long. You're, you're scratched, you're cut, your own body intervenes. Um, and in fact, the reason you live so long and we all live so long is because it's intervening right from when you're a baby. A little tiny thing goes wrong. Most of your health is due to your own self-repair mechanisms. So if we want to be as complex as we want to be, as, to be, as we have now in the future, we will need to make bridges that know their damage and self-repair. Trains, cars, phones. And it may be the future is that in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, that yes, you do forget to take your phone out of your back pocket as you go to the loo. And yes, you do hear that plop. <laughs> and yes, you do have to fish it out in quite a disgusting way. Those things probably won't change. But then, it will, you'll put it into a little bed, wrap it up warm, give it a little lem sip, and it will get better. That is the future I think we're going to walk into. Professor Mark Madovnik, we're about to um, open it up. Just before we do, um, that's a very optimistic future, but something we haven't talked about really is society and politics and what they might be like in the future. Um, if you, uh, your car lasts for 100 years or your phone lasts for 40 years or whatever, it's not much good if somebody's stolen it after um, the first 10 minutes of that. So can we, at very interesting political times at the moment, if you told people five years ago that you'd have Trump in America, Macron in France, Theresa May in Britain, or at least she was when he walked into the room, who knows, um, now, uh, hasn't been a government in Northern Ireland for nearly two years now. Um, so anarchy, a lot of people talk, more and more people talk about anarchy and mm. some uh, young people, they want, I mean, they welcome it. They see it as a positive thing, anarchy. Um, just quick round on the uh, shape of politics and society in the, in the future. Who'd like to start? Well, in Belgium, they now celebrate once a year the period when for two and a half years they went without mm. a national government. Mm. They say it was the best time in their mm. history. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, changing the way we're governed. And, of course, the, the iPhone in your pocket means that the news is now ahead of the facts. And in those circumstances, the current political system is not viable. Not viable at all? No, I don't think it is. Which, so, uh, how which, would you change it? I mean, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Something will develop mm -hmm. out of the way we now communicate. But we want the news to be with us before it's happened. This is wrecking the media because, you know, the Today programme is trying to find out what tomorrow's news is going mm. to be to keep up with Facebook. And politicians can now get away with saying anything because the news is garbage. So, you know, Putin, Trump, um, whoever we've got in this country at the moment, it, it's all the same. It's <laughs> it, it just it's an indication that, the, that politics cannot cope with the way we are now connected. And a lot of... Mark, a lot, a lot of um, Political thinkers talk about they see the future as a kind of mobile phone plebiscite or endless referenda in people. It'd be like Ant and Deck will be there, or at least one of them will be there on a Saturday, <laughs> on a Saturday night, and you'll vote on what you want uh, tax to be or um, the defence policy to be or whatever. I mean, um, I think that politics becomes useful or, in fact, absolutely necessity, and governments become necessity when you have huge change. I think when you don't have change. Things can tick along. In fact, the country is run, actually, by engineering companies and hospitals and, and, and those organisations. They run the country when things are not changed. It's when you want a big wholesale change in the way that we live that you need governments and, and, and they come into play, right? And um, so we are going through a, a period of enormous change. I mean, not just technological change, but born out of these things like the internet and social media, but also um, uh, environmental change. And so this, this century, surely, will throw some big curveballs at us, which we're not quite sure about. Well, sea levels are rising. Uh, they, that's just going to be bad news. And they're not going to, pretty much, then it's very unlikely they'll stop rising for 100 years. That's, that's half a meter, at least. 
that is, that, that's going to create a lot of change. And that probably is going to make some countries less easy to live in. And that's going to cause migration. What do we, how do we treat those people who are migrants? Not their fault. In fact, it's probably fault is very hard to attribute in this situation. But they, we will need to look after them. And if we don't look after them, there will be war. And so to me, that, to me that, that's, that's where politics is going to start to become really important, which is the, the equity of living on a planet where the environmental change is global, but the effects are local. Sarah, your um, home country has had quite a political um, surprise uh, in, oh, the yeah. last, in the last um, couple of years. You, you can tell us if Russia did it, because you know all that oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, but um, With the what, what, was it Russia? I don't know. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on the, on the wider question yeah. of the future of society and politics. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe it speaks to the kind of circles who are into cryptocurrencies mm. and that I hang around with, you know, that I've heard an increasing number of people kind of questioning the whole notion of, of the nation state, really, and uh, to be honest, you know, what it's, what it's serving. And, you know, I, I think it goes back to this kind of loss of trust and this examination of our institutions and, and this question, you know, that uh, it's sort of been a very one-sided relationship up to now. You know, we sort of give over everything. Um, we sort of do what we're told. And, and we're actually sort of starting to wonder, well, what am I really getting out of this bargain? Um, and, you know, as, as we've heard, a lot of the issues that we're facing as a society are, are global, you know, they, they require things like global coordination, uh, you know, issues like climate change. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's actually so radical to say, well, if I can't really identify sort of what it gets me, you know, to be a US citizen, you know, to be living in the UK, um, to actually start questioning the, the whole concept of a nation state doesn't actually sound so crazy. Mm. Chan. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree that you know, people are going to start thinking about that because, again, it's, it's what a, in terms of politics, there's, I think there are some sinister aspects there. You know, we've got supply chains that are being kept in place because of the resource that is owned by very few people. And that means, so I'm very hopeful you know, when Mark talks about self-healing things and, and disrupting that supply chain and the, the, the constant extraction. Um, and then also in terms of how we might govern. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be you know, plebiscite and referendum on on Facebook, but I think we're developing the technology and the tools, at least, for something to be created when we, when you know, or for something to emerge that may be sensible. Um, but there is, you know, there, there are still a small number of people that own vast quantities of resources that have weaponry. Right? It's it's not as if this is just going to happen, and there isn't an evolving force trying to stop it happening. There is. You know, Trump came in and brought Rex Tillerson, the former CEO of mm -hmm. Exxon Mobil. Right? It's, it's not. Um, taking out the, the Environmental Protection Agency and all these kind of things, are, you're trying to sustain it. So to me, it feels like a bit of a, a last gasp, no, 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 this is ours attempt before things like the materials and the technologies and the, the architecture and the spaces and, and the connection and the way multidisciplinary um, sort of expertise starts to come together around problems that we actually all care about. So rather than being a physicist, I come into a room as a human bringing that skill. And, and I think that's, that's all happening, but it's not going to be without... Um, some pain. And uh, very briefly, uh, when you talk about supply chains, what uh, late President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, that, uh, that there are lots of people who want states, some people argue this about Britain and China and so on, the nuclear deterrent, uh, it, it benefits them to keep these nations on a permanent war footing. A absolutely. And, and what's very interesting is that if you look at other countries' analyses of these things, they often call it the um, scientific military-industrial complex. And then you look at the role in ICE here thinking, oh, wow, building this dark matter technology, which can actually be used as a... And so I think that introspection and looking at what we're doing, that intention and the value of, of you know, who we are and why we do what we do, that's, that's an emergent thing now that more and more people are asking. And as we start to learn that more and more people are asking it, we're not alone in asking this, that's great. And I think the technologies that Facebook, in terms of connecting people, I don't think it really did, it connected... It allowed you to put all of what you want to be seen out there. It really put you out there. These people aren't really your friends. They're just clicks. And, um, whereas more people actually starting to connect over spaces, be like you know, pubs or some next iteration of this or something, yeah, is, um, is where we're going to have interesting change, I think. OK, the immediate future here is you get to um, ask questions, make points. Um, which uh, we'll take that in a moment, and then Abby will tell me if there's any from outside. Yes, you go first, please. Oh, we've got microphones, so we get a microphone. Just keep your hand up so we can get the microphone to you. There we are. Uh, and we've got a microphone over there, so to do as many as possible, if someone over there wants to wave 
for the uh, other microphone. Yes. Hi. Um, wh one thing I feel we haven't touched upon in the future is artificial intelligence and, and robots and so on and so forth. How, 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 how do we think that's going to impact the future of human? Um, AI, who would like to? The, 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 um, it is, I mean, a lot of people think it's going to be, I think Mark did sort of touch on this um, somewhat. Yeah, but the, 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 we're, we're doing something very interesting. We're sort of in terms of reproducing a brain, right, where we're, you've, you've got these sensors in the brain that hold memory and facts and all this kind of stuff. We've done that with the internet. It's very interesting. You just need to plug it into something that can self-learn now, and you've got it. You've got something that at least mimics um, consciousness, this sort of feedback between what we have, you know, basal ganglia, the prefrontal cortex, this, you know, what, what's happening out here and how we match it to our internal realities. And so it's this other bit that we haven't quite got yet, but we are mimicking, or not even mimicking, we're creating intelligence, if not what we might call consciousness. Um, and so that, that is a, um, it will be what we program it to be. You know, we do a lot of, a lot of work here at UCL in, in data intensive sciences in the physics department and, and, and elsewhere in maths and, and everywhere else. And something that we teach you know, very early on is that you, know, you, you get out what you put in. And this thing will be, and it'll be a bigger threat as whatever you program it to be. If you tell it we're warlike, evil, you know, selfish individuals that don't care about our natural systems, guess what it is going to be? It's, it's, it's our child almost. So I guess for me, it goes right back to this question of, of transparency. I mean, so in a lot of ways. So in one sense, we have these tech companies kind of just going forward with these technologies that you know could have profound impacts on society and you know government sort of just isn't operating at that pace and again they're really not regulating this sector so they're just sort of like hoping for the best in some way um, the other thing is yeah I've seen uh, luckily I think a lot of activity um, increasingly and a lot of funding for grants looking at transparency in algorithmic decision making right so a lot of people are very excited about you know algorithms in the use of policing and stuff like that, you know, predictive policing, where's there going to be a crime next? And, you know, again, if you feed in sort of racist training data, then what you get back is just ingrained, further ingrained versions of the same systems we have now, except you can't even say how they got there, right? Because you can't trace through the algorithm and say, oh, you know, why is this happening? Why is racial profiling worse than ever? Um, you know, you just say, oh, it's the algorithm and machines are unbiased and so, you know, it's all fine. And so I, I think it's something that we need to be tackling. Uh, I've seen that we, we are, um, and, but yeah, it's a very, very important issue. Um, yes, over there, someone has a, well, there are two hands over there, so we'll, we'll do both of those. So keep, yes, keep them raised and then can we get a microphone? So we'll whiz through those people, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, so as we think of the future, Mark's materials will have um, self-healing properties. Um, AI will be taking decisions for us, so we don't have to think of uh, making a decision about where we're going to eat, um, how we're going to do anything. So the question is really the future of human cognition. At that point, are we really going to be engaged? What are we going to do with our time? What are we going to do with the gray matter between our ears? Um, are we going to be spending all of our time at the pub? Um, I don't think the microphone's quite working, so I'll just repeat that. The question was about the future of human cognition. If the world changes so much, what will we be doing with our brains, or will we, we be spending all the time in the pub? Uh, that seemed aimed at you for some reason. Well, uh, I think we'll be spending an awful lot more time trying to work out how the artificially intelligent gadgets we own work. <laughs> uh, and trying to find a way around them so we can actually talk to somebody who can make an appointment for us to see the doctor. Uh, I, I get the impression that the more artificial intelligence there is, the more we have to do to keep up with it. So I'm not worried about our cognitive functions breaking down. I think the other thing is that we will quickly realize that artificial intelligence is created by people without natural intelligence. Um, and we'll realize its shortcomings. Uh, and I think at that point, there's a lot of scope for us actually to demand the kind of artificial intelligence and the tools that we need. So, no, I, I think ingenuity will continue to happen. I think people will continue to think. 
We don't have an economist on the panel. I don't know who knows most about economics. Does anyone know anything about economics? You no, does the LSE do that? Oh, right, OK. Yeah. No, no, but it, it's obviously key to this, because um, if you have uh, more and more work done by um, AI, by um, automated systems, how does the economy work? I mean, I think that we've done a little bit. So, so on the self-healing uh, cities project that I'm working on, we've there's quite a large component of it is the economics of it because we're proposing to put a lot of people out of work, the people who currently mend the roads and, and dig up the roads and mend all the water supplies and, and everyone. And that's a large component of society. And um, when you look into that, what you see is that those, those jobs are less and less economically viable, that they, they return less value to the person themselves. So th those jobs are becoming less and less able to survive on those salaries. And, and, and similarly, I'd like to put is, is what's happened to farming. And in some ways, infrastructure has, is way behind farming. If you go to a farm now, there'll be three people there and a load of machinery, combine harvesters, and they're incredibly productive, those three people. And they have actually, they, they have time to enjoy the farming. They have time to enjoy the countryside and to think about biodiversity and so on. But when you look at what we've done to cities, is that what we've done is we've kind of, we've still got people with very little equipment doing the jobs. And so you've got to up their production value. So we've got to invest in robots in order to be, instead of there being 10 people who are going to repair a stretch of motorway, there's one person and a very sophisticated robot. And that person will be paid a lot of money because they'll be very highly skilled. But then the key question, what happens to the other nine? Because the nightmare scenario is you end up with people who have all this free time but no money and no house. But people have been talking about that for a long time, and that's, that's not how it works in farms. There's not lots of people in farms who've got lots of free time. Um, what's happened, I, I, I suppose, uh, what's happened is that you, you, have, you are able to spend your time uh, doing other things uh, other than using a scythe. I, I recently had to scythe the field, and um, it was voluntary. But you know, you realize that there were hundreds of people in the countryside um, making, uh, you know, reaping the harvest. And bread was very expensive. If you want 50p loaves of bread, if you want everyone to be able to afford bread, you need machines. If you want infrastructure, which means you can go on holiday, you can go to the moon, or you can have your mobile phone, you need machines. That, I think that's the, that's the logic of the econ economics here. But as you know, as academics, some people have argued um, that the huge expansion of the uh, higher education system was, is social engineering. It's to delay the entry into a workplace that has no jobs of more and more young people. Um, so that is the huge question. Is there going to be work in the future to sustain an economy and the population? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, you know, we miss, we miss you know, if we go back to the, the Industrial Revolution and what the, what the economists and the thinkers were, were talking about, there was ideas that as technology came in to supplant a workforce, that the money that's being generated, that same economic growth and wealth, just gets distributed to the people that are out of work. Instead, what we've done is ciphered, or rather it's controlled by just a few people, so you've got mass unemployment. So then, yeah, you do have to start delaying you know, them entering the workforce where there are no jobs. I think it's correcting that. It's a supply chain issue again. It's understanding who's making disproportionate um, money and, and holding structures that are keeping things in place you know, and, and look, exposing those relationships and understanding what's going on there. But, but I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where, you know, as Mark, yeah, talking before about once we got you good at stones, there was something else. And now we're good at something, there'll be something else. So once we're good at you know, AI and doing whatever, there'll always be something else. I, I think we need to um, be cognizant of life and what it's doing in terms of biological evolution. Right? We're, we're one facet, one manifestation of something else, some sort of information that's creating stuff beginning with us um, to put more stuff out here. And where's it heading? And I think you can see that we, we tackle threat and we, we come together whenever there's a threat coming around us where we have to unite and now the, we have to unite over global threats so we're going to have to come together but interestingly it's also at the same time where we're getting self-healing um, materials which is exactly what we need if we're ever going to get off earth right, and get off places so in terms of growing and moving out further and further and further it's um, we shouldn't be worried that there's you know what comes when we're all done when we're done it's there's, there's more um, someone over there yes I'm increasingly worried as I hear everyone about the insularity of the use of we and society 
there are still a large percentage of the population of the world who've never made a phone call on anything. We don't seem to be discussing them. Are we assuming we're going to drag everyone kicking and, kicking and screaming willy-nilly into our version of the future? Or are we considering how we might accommodate the variety which has actually been a strong source of the resilience of the human species in the past? No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, we can learn more from the third world than they can learn from us. Um, we're, we're the ones that are going to hell in a handcart. Um, we need to learn more about how society bonds. We need to learn more about how people can actually produce their own food and be self-sustaining rather than uh, building ever and ever um, higher piles of, of things that aren't stable. Um, so I, I fully agree with that. I think it, it, it must be a two-way process and there's more to learn than there is to give. It's not the, you know, it's the sort of the fifth cavalry approach of the Americans. Look at Canary Wharf, you know. We, we don't need the city of London, we'll build one downriver. Mm. Uh, well, you know, it went downriver. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you entirely and I think, I think that's what I was trying to hint at with the, the global warming thing is that the we you know, there's, there's, there's going to be, there isn't a we at the moment in terms of our response to global warming, there's, there's factions. And part of that, I think, is because some countries are going to do well out of global warming. Some countries are, are going to do fine. And some are going to be disastrously bad. And we haven't got a way yet where we can be equitable about that. And well, just we, give it, that's need, fascinating. An example of a country that would do well out of global warming. Russia will probably do well. Rising sea levels are not going to affect it dramatically. It doesn't rely, it hasn't got, you know, it's got St. Petersburg, which is on the coast, but, but actually a lot of its infrastructure is, is high. Uh, it's got a huge amount of its land, which is currently, uh, you know, permafrost, which, which become very productive. It's got an enormous amount of minerals underneath there. That will become maybe very temperate and a lovely place to live, Siberia, for instance. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll all be going on holiday to Siberia. And um, <laughs> it's... Uh, there are other, uh, Canada will, will, will probably do well. Um, in, it, it's all about current models, but yeah, the Northern Hemisphere will do better than the Southern Hemisphere for sure, uh, mm. because most of the land mass is east-west on that. Uh, so, 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 so in fact, you're absolutely right. We, we, we need to have a global we. It's, it's absolutely imperative, but it seems a long way off. I, I guess I would just say, um, actually in this sort of cryptocurrency space, um, a lot of the use cases and a lot of the applications are being driven more in the developing world than in, in, civil, uh, in societies like, like this one, right? So, you know, here I think I'm saying, oh, you know, don't trust the government, don't trust banks, and people are like, I mean, whatever, like my bank account's fine and I use my credit card and it's all good. So actually, the more sort of interesting use cases are exactly in parts of the world where these institutions are weaker, where they've never really existed successfully in the first place, you know, where the national currency sort of isn't so successful, and so what people actually do is trade, you know, mobile phone minutes or trade the US dollar, um, or, you know, transact mobile to mobile. So I, I do agree. I mean, there's lots of people who don't interact regularly with technology. I mean, I think we have seen a disproportionate rise in the use of things like the mobile phone um, in, in areas sort of outside of the first world. Um, so, yeah, I think actually, um, thank you for your question, um, and it, it's something to keep in mind, but it is actually something that we're in, in this particular space. It's kind of like, well, there's nothing to displace, and so it, we can actually try these things out and really see how they work. Someone from the middle, yes, please. Can we get a question across? There's a hand raised there. Maybe. Hi, um, my children are the future. So what skills would you want to impart to your children and grandchildren to make sure that they are able to deal with what is coming? Um, skills for children and grandchildren. I, 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 I think it's, um, it, it's sort of going back to the, the question the gentleman asked over here a little bit. I think that what we're also learning um, from other parts of the world is, um, is wisdom, understanding of natural environments, what actually matters in terms of sustaining us. Um, lots of stuff is all well and good, um, but a, a sort of an attachment to stuff where you're really, where, where greed becomes a, a, a worldview, where we're all about accumulating things. That's, um, the planet just doesn't have any more space for, for that level of greed, that level of narcissism anymore. Um, we've, got to, we've got to come out of that. And that, that, for me, I think it's, there's technical skill, and that will be whatever, you know, the, what's the left hemisphere, I realize I keep talking about the brain, even though it's a dark matter physicist, but that, that whatever the person is interested in is where they'll go, and that's, that's all well and good. But understanding things like, um, 
I think the human qualities that we're really ignoring, things like forgiveness and love and compassion, words that you're not allowed to say in politics, right, which is ab absurd, words that we're not allowed to really use very easily, even talking about climate change, it's countries coming together and actually working together, it means we've got to understand and heal um, past wounds. We're, we're a people that's divided with all these lines over a map, and they're just lines to say that this is us and we're not you and these are our resources and stay away. And that isn't going to cut it anymore. The world has shifted. You know, we've now got technologies that connect everyone up. The way our supply chains work are all over the world. It doesn't make sense anymore for individuals in particular parts of the world to, to be sucking all that up. So for me, what I've learned with, you know, for myself, the most important thing that I want to impart um, to my um, daughter is um, forgiveness, healing, understanding things about your own inner psyche and your own intention and what it is your own fixed action patterns and biases and why you're acting the way you're acting. Understand that. You're just showing yourself something about your own inner state. And that's what this external thing is, right? We're, we're, we're manifesting something that is not just our conscious, but our unconscious as well. If we've got long, long-held trauma there, um, we're, we're going to find it hard to move on. Um, I'd say as, yeah. As an English graduate on the panel, I'd say, I mean, I've talked to my children about this, because I worry about, and it's a big thing for university, I think, that what's defined as functionally useful, learning useful skills. I mean, I was uh, at this university when Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale came out, and that, reading that book and her and other writers, has helped me to understand the world, and it shaped me. Um, you know, reading the whole of Shakespeare here did. Um, so I think we have, that's what I think we have to be careful about, is the idea that there are functional skills and then this other stuff, because this other stuff is what yeah. keeps us human, I think. Yeah, and I mean, we're sending human. far too many people to universities, mm -hmm. a lot of them getting degrees in something they're not terribly interested mm -hmm. in, and preparing them for jobs they won't be very happy in. Mm -hmm. It'd be far better if we educated people through their lives rather than just at the start. Gustav Holst, the great English composer who wrote the Planet Suite, used to have to teach to make a living, and he always said to his students, never learn anything until it's a disadvantage not to know it. <laughs> because then you'll use it, then you'll remember it, it's useful to you. And the one thing we've really lost sight of in this country is technical education. Giving people skills of things they can do, things they can make, things they can be passionate about, and things that will adapt and change, and practical skills they'll be able to use through their lives, and then top up on through education. But I think the most important thing that we can teach the next generation is not to listen to our crazy ideas. <laughs> um, any, yes. Uh, can we get a microphone across? Keep, just keep your hand raised, yeah. Sorry. And then, yeah. Well, no, we'll, we'll do the two of you. As long as you can be relatively brief, we'll do both. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, my question runs on a, a similar basis, really, uh, to the ones we've just had. But what I, I live in two different worlds. Uh, let me just quickly explain. I come from a very poor background. Um, my parents have very, very different views from my partner who I met. Um, and we can't all meet people from UCL who teach us to think for ourselves. What do you think uh, we can do as, um, as people to encourage others to change their views? Because my family live in a, a society of fear and are very poor. They don't have an idea on how to move forward. So, we, and as I say, we can't all meet UCL graduates and be taught to think for ourselves. So what do you suggest that we do to help those people who have very backwards views which are dragging us further and further behind and not looking forward? Because the government doesn't, they're dragging us backwards too. They're giving us ideas of going back to the 70s. Rhys Marg encourages us not to uh, look at abortion and things like that. But what can we do to change that? Because we're very separate from the, what people are calling the elite and people who could possibly help us change. So this question, a, a, a sort of broader education and changing. I mean, it, I, guess, I guess I feel very strongly that, um, that what we've done is we've kind of um, made schools a kind of elitist place in a way because it, it's all very focused on the three R's, 
you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, which is, a, which is a distortion anyway of what the three R's were when they were originally introduced. They were, they were reading, writing, and rorting. And rorting is making. But they were changed. Uh, and it was kind of an idea of like what, what it is. It, it is a kind of elite idea of what it is to understand the world, which is very cerebral. And actually, um, we've disenfranchised a whole set of people who, who think about the world very physically, sensually. And I think all of us you know, will be better off if we have both a balance of sensual understanding, physical making, and, and, and a kind of a cerebral understanding, abstract thinking, let's say. And so shifting, <coughs> shifting the schools so that in the school, half of your time is making stuff and half your time is thinking about stuff seems to me to be one of the ways in which we can value people from all backgrounds uh, and, and all you know, ways of looking at the world. Instead of saying, well, you're deficient in this, so you need to learn this, and if you can't do it, you're a failure. And it feels like that's the way the schools have been for quite a long time. And I think that is one of the biggest problems. And it comes back to this lack of technical education, but just lack of, lack of making. It's a very pleasurable thing. It is really how you understand how the whole world is made, how it fits together. Quick, anyone quickly on that? Anyone want to? I, I, yeah, I think um, similarly, you know, the, the getting, I think it's networks. I, I think it's connecting people, you know, in, in, if you've got an environment where, first off, I don't, I don't you kind of said quite a few things, you know, like living in two worlds, it's not two worlds, it's, it's the one. Um, and it's, it's how do you then connect? So I know, I know exactly. And, and that's a split that we've kind of, you know, we're, we're creating this sort of dual thing where it's sort of us and them that's going on. And that, that's what has to heal. And it's not, a, it's not a fight. I don't think we're forward or backward, right? We're, we've all evolved to be where we are right now. And it, how, we, how we reach others, how we connect to others, um, getting somebody out of a place of fear can't be done through the brain. You can't, you can't thought them into not feeling fear anymore. It's a felt embodied thing. And the opposite, you know, of, of it's interesting, there's a wonderful quote that says, the, um, fear is just the, just as darkness is the absence of light, fear is just the absence of love. Right? And I think that's how you do it. It's, it's understanding that, that there's, it, it's, it's not just all done in the brain and what we say. Actually, there's a lot more to, to being human, to being part of life than, than trying to convince people that they're wrong and we're right. Okay, last question in the room, but then you can carry on afterwards. Um, I'll try to do these, yeah, yes. very quickly, if you... Um, do I speak? Uh, the self, yes. the computers in the robots and in, say, driverless vehicles are incorporating algorithms which are becoming self-learning. And I fear that the self-learning algorithms in these machines can be unpredictable. And there has been a case where things have gone wrong, and it's taken you know, a year or two to understand what's gone wrong. So where are we going to go on that front? OK, I'm just going to hold that there, and then I'll take this, and these will be the last two together at, at the back. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what UCL's responsibility in climate change is when we invest 12.5 million in fossil fuels. Um, OK, uh, we'll take those in. Um, well, do, do that one first. Anyone want to speak yeah, to the institution? Uh, our responsibility is to divest. It, it, it's, to, it's to get more people understanding that our own research and our own data says you can't burn a single barrel anymore. And that we've got to, we've got to you know, but we, we've, we've, we're also living in, in the real economic world. Right? It's not as straightforward and as simple as just saying, OK, we're going we're gonna to go by ideals that we've just, you know, concluded based on some data and then act on them just like that, right? I, it's, it's, a, it's a process, but the more people understand this, the more people understand that divestment is gonna be key to switching to um, renewable technology, the, the, the better. And is it likely to happen? Yeah, I think it's inevitable. Right. It's, and then the question, I was thinking, one of the last, uh, one of the books I read here for English was um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and that does come up, it comes up in that question, self-learning algorithms. The Bitcoin, the fear that, yeah. um, the fear of these new, these I mean, changes. I'd like to say about the self-driving cars is that the biggest, biggest cause of death worldwide is cars, right? So this is, for young people, uh, sorry, for young people, biggest cause of death. So, so we have these, these things that are killing people on, a, on just a momentous scale. And we've kind of accepted it as a society. It's a kind of the price we pay for, for freedom, isn't it? And, we, and that's the price, the price so far. And we kind of had seat belts and, and airbags and crumple zones. But ultimately, we're, I think as a society, hanging on to that. I think self-driving cars are the way out of this they will be much safer in the future. And that's not to say there won't be a difficult transition period. But if you really look at the future, 
and you really want transport to be safe, as safe as the railways, as safe as airplanes, if you want car driving to be that safe, you need something that's better than humans driving them. <laughs> but the uh, problem with the self-driving cars, of course, is once the artificial intelligence becomes so good that they're 100% safe, then pedestrians and cyclists will go straight in front of them and they'll be totally functionless. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, look, I'm sure um, we can carry on afterwards. Uh, thank you very much to um, all of you, the wider audience, and particular, particularly to the panellists, Professor Peter Rees, uh, Dr. Chamkor Gag, Dr. Sarah Micklejohn, and Professor Mark Midovnik. <laughs>